Welcome everyone to the sixth episode of Articulating with David Barnett. Today we have a local artist with us, Cynthia Turrell, and she has graciously agreed to speak with us about her artwork and her creative process. So welcome, Cynthia. Thank you very much. Um, as always, my name is Sharon. I am one of the co-hosts along with our gallery owner and director. I guess to begin with today, uh, Cynthia, if you wouldn't mind sharing with everyone a bit about your background, where you're from, and kind of how you got started as an artist. Certainly. Um, I actually come from perhaps two and a half miles west. I was born at Misericordia Hospital just on Juno, and it's been since torn down, but it seems as though my life has been sort of a 20-mile square uh, radius my whole life. And I wasn't seriously intending to become an artist, um, but art always kind of found me. Sure. So I have very early memories of being, my mother said that in the high chair I was drawing at two. Um, but I also recall, I was probably four years old, um, where we lived was above my grandmother, and I had an older brother at the time and a younger sister, and my mother would take shelf paper and she would roll it out on the long kitchen table, and she'd put crayons and pencils and pens, and my brother and sister and I would spend hours just drawing, 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 and we were real influenced by Grandma Moses' paintings. Um, my mother showed us a book of the mm-hmm. paintings, and we kind of tried to emulate those. We made these little scenes that were real packed with detail and little people doing things. And so it was really just really, really fun to do. And then when I actually got into school, um, for some reason, art was always something I was really good at. But I was very, very shy. I remember being maybe second grade, and the teacher wanted me to stand up and show the rest of the class my the piece that I did. And I remember being kind of mortified, but I grabbed it, and I pulled it up, and I put my head you know, behind it. And then I remember <laughs> how she was talking about it. Look at what she did. And, and I remember sitting there kind of going like this, yeah, like I was so, I was cringing, but I was so happy and thrilled at the same time. Aww. I was really proud. Yeah. And then take it down. Um, and so that kind of just went on uh, all through grade school. Then I transferred to this small private school that they did a lot of arts because they couldn't afford anything like physical education. So we did a lot of language and arts. And by the time I got to high school, um, I had developed this style and I had been working just on my own for the longest time that when I got there the instructor Earl Kittleson who was a painter in the area at one point um, he just said you know what I don't I don't want to do anything to you he goes I want you to just do what you feel like doing and I remember thinking well this is odd and I aren't I supposed to learn something? And he goes, okay, if you like to draw, just the, here's, I'll give you one bit of instruction. Hold the pencil as if you are signing your name. And I thought, okay, and I always remember that to this day. I'm, when I'm starting a new drawing, I'll go, okay, I can hold my pencil the way. And they had me work on my own. And they called my work Lundism because he said he had not seen anything like it. And that was my maiden name, Lund. And they gave me a little solo show in the display booths outside of the art department. And it was really, really wild and kind of trippy. Once he showed us this film, and the film was of Picasso painting on glass. Um, it's, a, I guess, a documentary from the 40s. And I remember sitting there in class just I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I was just mesmerized by it. Sure. And I thought, oh, I want to do that. <laughs> and yet, oddly enough, I left school, and I think it was from having a very 
practical mother who grew up in the Depression. She really thought that I needed to have some kind of skills that were more employable. She knew that I was good at art, but she said, you really need to do something else. Yeah, so something that'll kind of translate yeah. to everyday life. Right, right. Sure. I guess she probably had heard stories of how difficult lives are for artists, professional artists. So I, I went for three months to school. Um, I was going to study some kind of social work, um, PT assistance. And then I had a lot of problems with, with um, panic attacks. And so I left school. And then I never went back. Um, so I had to kind of deal with the whole dynamic of that. By the time I was kind of OK enough to consider going to, to school, art school or something, um, a lot of people told me, they said, well, you have a very distinctive style. You, you go to art school to learn how to develop a style. Sure. And you have that. So why do that? And I kind of thought, okay, maybe I don't need to do that. And I still was half in and half out. I was working in uh, the rehabilitation field, and I was working with psychiatric patients. And I loved it. It was very, very gratifying. But then I started, art always kind of like was right here on my shoulder. And I would um, start doing portraits of some of the patients that were not real responsive. Mm -hmm. The other people really liked that and were enjoying that. I also just started kind of very um, self-taught art therapy with my patients and clients. And that was really, really fun. And I continued doing that until things got I got kind of burned out, and if I, I had to make a decision. If I was going to stay in that field, I had to go back to school and really decide to get a degree and plant myself. Or by that time, I had had a little bit of background in doing some of, I, I started doing some ads for them. So I was sort of like this ad hoc commercial artist. So then, self-taught, I became a commercial artist for okay. a long time. And I did that for 45 years and was a graphic designer, creative director. But somewhere along the way, I think I was, well, I know, I was 33 and a third. I just know it was very specific. I started drawing again, very much in earnest. And from that point on, you get what you're seeing behind you and what is the... Okay the majority of the work that I did has all been done in the last 34 years. What I find interesting the most out of just everything you shared with us uh, was the fact that your high school art teacher, mm -hmm. that he really kind of gave you this free reign to create, really just kind of nurtured you and allowed you to work on your own vision, your own voice, and, and really develop it and refine it. I, that to me is incredible because um, you just don't find that very often. You know, that there's a teacher out there who's willing to kind of step back and let the student find their own way. Um, but I love that he would tell you to, you know, approach drawing with as though you're writing your signature. Because I think just in general, for me, I know when I'm writing my signature, it's something you do without thinking, you know, mm -hmm. it's something you do with ease. And so to me, that would make sense to approach, you know, creating artwork that way. It's mm -hmm. kind of putting you in this spot where you're just kind of at ease, you're comfortable, you know, and you can just begin. So I think that's really cool. And I know that drawing has been your primary medium, although you also work, uh, with uh, mixed media collage. Mm -hmm. um, what is it about working in those mediums that kind of ingratiated you to them as compared to something like painting or sculpture? Mm -hmm. um, I did dabble with um, painting and sculpture um, early on. <clears throat> Excuse me, it was not something that I, 
I just didn't have a, I just didn't feel like it was right for me. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It didn't. Didn't connect with it the yeah, way you did right. to drawing materials. There was something about drawing that, especially black and white drawing, that I loved the instant abstract nature of it. It instantly became something abstract once I took away any of the color. And I felt as though I was unearthing something. Drawing for me is, it's very tactile. And sometimes I actually let the light in the room get really dim and I will not turn on any auxiliary lighting as I'm going because I like to have my vision occlude a bit and I like to just keep asking myself, where's the light, where's the dark, where's the light, where's the dark? And then I feel like it's emerging. It's, it sounds a little wacky, but, um, and what else it does though is it's very, it's very muscular for me. I feel like I, I put in a lot of pressure when I'm making dark areas. I'm really leaning in, and um, even if I grab a, a softer lead to get a darker line, I'm working it so much so that I blew out my shoulders and my neck for oh this. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and uh, and I couldn't. I actually could not draw for a while. Um, I was in so much physical pain. It's about probably like ten years ago. And so that's when I started playing around with dots and collage and okay. that because I would set something up and I could put it upright and then I'd bring in maybe, you know, a piece of some ink and I would start working on it upright where I was completely okay with my neck and my shoulders. So I, I would find ways to be able to work on things at a different angle to different degrees. Um, since all this has happened in the last couple years, I've had a ton of physical therapy and I'm pretty good. I'm also learning things that I cannot do. Yeah. Um, but now I'm, I'm enjoying doing both because it's been so much fun to throw in color. People used to joke, go, oh, you know, are you allergic to color or something? What is it that you don't? I go, I love color. I'm just, it's got so much energy though. It kind of scares me. And so it's still, to me, a real kick to play with color because I'm just starting. I usually have a couple different projects going at the same time, then I'll switch over to a different medium. Mm -hmm. So it's more in line of how is my body responding, you know, sure. what can which I do? makes sense. You're mm -hmm. kind of giving yourself a balanced hours before you were like throwing everything right. into one piece to the point that it was actually detrimental to your health. Mm -hmm. I, I understand what you're saying about color too. I think color can be, especially working with color can be almost overwhelming as an art historian and somebody who has studied uh, for many years and, you know, researched, uh, I could see where color would, would definitely be overwhelming. There were times when Matisse decided, uh, as a great colorist, that he wanted to just work in black and white. So, for example, some of his black and white drawings, and there was a period when he was doing black and white lithographs. Was there a reason that... Did he just wanted to reason? get a complete change hmm. from like doing very... <laughs> with so much color. Yeah. I think he wanted to get to the essence more of a pure state of drawing, which of course if you're just drawing in black and white you can achieve that. And that's and drawing is really the essence of an artist's work. That's a nucleus, that's where everything else comes from. So thus our three centuries of drawing show. And when Cynthia first came into the gallery uh, to have her works photographed and also for framing, we were working on the drawing show and I'd never seen anything like her work before, totally innovative and unique. And so we offered to have her works included in a major way. I'm thrilled, I really am. Well, I know we are very excited to have you, you know, coming up at the next show and just to be a part of the gallery. It was really kind of cool the way this all took place because I think David had just made the decision to focus on drawing for the next show. And then you literally came in like uh, within a few days after that okay. with your work and 
it was just boom, 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 everything hmm. kind of fell into place from Didn't there. I know that. That's, that's really wild. Yeah, so it's really kind of like, I feel like fate played, played <laughs> a hand in all of it, just brought us all together at the right time. Just kind of wrap things up here. I guess one of the last things I would love to uh, speak to you about, because I know we've gotten asked this question uh, by many people that have been able to preview some of your work as we've been framing it. I was reading something you had written about uh, this work here, actually, um, the graphite on paper, but the presence. Uh, and you had mentioned that it took you about two and a half months to complete that, and that that's actually a shorter time frame for you to work in, which that in itself blew my mind because I thought, wow, that takes a lot of commitment. You know, is there, I guess, an average time frame that you work within? Most of the drawings would take between three and four months for oh, me wow. to do. And it's crazy. It kind of, I, I don't draw every day because mm. there are some days when I approach the drawing and I actually can't. See, it, I think it has something to do with, it has nothing to do with vision itself. It has to do with my, the way my brain is processing the information where I feel stuck. Usually I'll just walk up to it and I'll go right there. That's where I got to go to work. Um, if I don't have that, I, I shouldn't do it because I've pushed myself. I've done that where I have approached the piece, not really felt that, mm -hmm. but hey, I can do this. I mean, I know that's a hand, you know, I can just, and I'll start working on it. And then the next day I'll come back in when I can see properly and I'm going, oh, what did I do? And I'll have to go back yeah. into repair mode. I mean, for artists, for writers, musicians, what have you, you know, you're, I think our best work is always done when we're just feeling it, when we're in that moment and it's like, okay, yes, this is what is going to come out of me now. Sometimes I just work right out of my head and just start drawing more like uh, Andre Masson did, auto automatism, where you just start without any preconceived ideas. And other times I'll, I'll make a sketch with some notes of what I want to do. Uh, how does that work w with the way you Same uh, approach thing. it? There are times when I just start. I'll just grab paper and I'll just start almost almost like a, an advanced doodle, I'll call it. And it'll just start that way and then I'll just continue it. Um, other times I'm really, really, I have something in my mind and I think, oh, I need to do a little research. I want to put something like this in there and I'll have to pull reference materials together um, that I can look at and then I'll do a whole structure, I'll do a whole sketch of the entire thing of course, it'll have some shifts as it goes, but it'll be something that I almost completely see in my head before I start. Those can be a little boring um, come week or month three when you're going, okay, oh, oh, now I know, all right, I'm gonna work on this section. But um, there's benefits to both, both, both ways. Sure, well, we just wanna thank everybody for uh watching and listening and especially thank you to you cynthia for joining us and letting us uh, talk to you today just about your amazingly beautiful and unique artwork thank and you. your creative process um, and for all of you uh, just so you know the drawing show that will be featuring cynthia's artwork the master strokes three centuries of drawing here at the david barnett gallery will be running through july 13th Thank you, everyone. Thank you both so much. Oh, our pleasure. Thanks for listening, and we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Bye.